will call then the first presenter, which is Alice Rauber uh, from Rio Grande do Sul Federal University, Brazil, uh, which will present Alexander's theories applied to urban design. Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Alice. I am from University of Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil. And this work I will present here is from my thesis research. So it's uh, um, undergoing working. So uh, using analytical methods uh, has been a challenge for us to, uh, it, since it's, it's not easy to become part of a design process. Uh, we usually use it, uh, lots of tools to analyze cities, but uh, it's not uh, easy to incorporate it to a design process. So we have tools for designing and, and tools for uh, analyzing cities. Um, the main purpose of this work is to uh, investigate some possibility of in incorporating uh, Christopher Alexander's theories uh, to a as an analytical method for using it in a design context, an urban design context. So Alexander has recently proposed uh, some interesting theories uh, which may become uh, an, a new way of um, analyzing and uh, designing cities. So he is a well-known uh, theorist and uh, he has been dedicated to developing uh, better ways to design and uh, he is better known by pat a paternal language. Uh, but my work is, is more about the most recent uh, works from him, Nature of Order. Uh, it's a far book and, and uh, related work, new concepts in, in complexity theory. Uh, and Harvard City in computations. So in this, how can I say, this new phase of his work, he has presented some <coughs> key concepts such as wholeness, centers, and uh, harmony seeking computations. And they are all related to harmony, the harmony reached by a system. And that is to say the cores of a given configuration. So I will uh, talk a little bit about these con concepts and then how can we uh, use them to uh, a, a new tool of urban design. So he says wholeness is the global character of a given configuration existing in space uh, both in nature and uh, man-made things. And uh, it's a abstract and mathematical st structure and uh, he also calls it living structure because for him uh, everything has some degree of life. Uh, not just uh, living organisms but uh, he says uh, buildings and cities uh, have some degree of life. Not all of them, but uh, especially the, the good cases. So he started studying uh, this quality <coughs> of uh, things uh, and uh, he, he called the, the centers the primary entities which uh, compose wholeness. So they are like the parts of the, the things. And uh, they have 
different levels of strength or coverings depending on how they uh, relate to each other. And uh, this relationship among centers are, uh, he describes it uh, as 15 kinds of relationship. And they help to increase and intensify the centers. Uh, it's a very abstract uh, thinking. And uh, I will not talk uh, about everyone, but they are uh, geometric properties and uh, they uh, help to uh, intensify centers. Like when you have uh, levels of scale, uh, things which are composed by uh, parts of different size. So in this case, you have levels of scale. And uh, so they, he has these uh, 15 geometric properties, uh, which for him, it explains uh, the quality of uh, all we see in nature and in uh, human artifacts. So, and the harmony seeking process is a stepwise process and it, it's also a structure preserving because things are not, uh, uh, um, how can I say? Well, the transformations uh, which led to, to an object, uh, the harmony and beauty of, the, of an, uh, an artifact, they obey some rules which are the 15 geometric properties. So uh, he says when you combine some, you, you don't, don't need to have all of the properties, but when you combine some of the properties, you will have this quality of coherence and beauty and harmony. So he calls it a harmony-seeking process. In nature, uh, it's always like this, like in this uh, example, in the image. And uh, in man-made things, uh, not always. So, but, but uh, we have examples like the uh, growing process of a city. Uh, it's not, uh, it's a stepwise process. Uh, so, uh, well, he says, if you recognize the, the structure and uh, you learn the, those properties, you could use it to uh, have a better design, or in this case, I, I uh, he, he talks about design in a wide context, but I will try to uh, bring it to a urban design context. So, and he says if this uh, wholeness and uh, the 15 properties uh, are object objectively uh, observed and described, so uh, it's measurable, he, he says. But he admits we don't have a mathematical language to do it. We still don't have it. So, uh, but he is sure that if we could measure it uh, and operationalize such a process, we could have, uh, could make a better design. And uh, I will, well, he, he's a very controversial author. Uh, I will not uh, discuss and, uh, um, about his philosophical view or, or stuff like this. But uh, I, my work is worried about uh, uh, how to, let's assume he's, he is right, uh, how to do it this research agenda he's proposing, how to, um, the main question, how to operationalize the harmony seeking process described by him and how to make it mathematically manageable. Uh, 
and how to bring it to a urban planning and design context. Because uh, he, he talks in a very abstract way, so it could be used for everything. Um, well, I, what I try to do is to bring it to a urban configurational perspective. Uh, I study ne network uh, analysis, so uh, I think it's a possibility to, to use it uh, to operationalize Alexander's abstract concepts. So if you took a network approach, <laughs> Uh, we could use a hierarchical graph in which centers are described as nodes and their relationship as the links, as already suggest, suggested by another author, Mijian. Uh, it seems to be an appropriate way to describe the mathematical the centers because he's, he always talks about the relationship and uh, it's the mathematical language to, to study relationship uh, between things. So, in urban systems or urban configurational studies, um, have produced several ways uh, of measuring uh, graph-based uh, measures and uh, methodologies to describe the metric measure the network properties of cities, like centrality and accessibility measures. And therefore, the, there are many ways to define hierarchical relationship between the, the centers, or here in this interpretation, the nodes of a, a graph. So the methodological procedure would be testing different ways of describing urban spatial, spatial structure, uh, testing different ways of measuring hierarchical relationship, revealing the underlying structure, uh, choose some of the centrality measures we, we already have, uh, and testing different ways of visualizing the results. So maybe it's my hypothesis. Uh, some ways of visualizing can, can be compared in, in some way to some of the geometric properties uh, described by Alexander. So I will try to bring uh, his ideas to a more concrete uh, view. So here are some images of how to represent the urban spatial structure as a, as a graph. Uh, we have um, intersections uh, as nodes. And, well, we, it's uh, or, already used in many research about network analysis, but uh, axial lines like space syntax use it, uh, or street segments. So each of, it, each of them uh, gives a different uh, view of the urban structure. And we have many centrality measure, measures, like I, I said. Um, previous work with which I, uh, I, I talked before by Bijani, he uses uh, one centrality measure, but uh, my point is that uh, we have many ways of measuring it, so uh, it would would be interesting to uh, combine many of them, or I don't know, choose <coughs> some of them. But uh, I think we, we, we need uh, more than one measure to reach the uh, spatial structure. Uh, 
this prescribing of seeds. And uh, besides the visualization in the map, uh, it's important to, to see the statistical analysis. Uh, there are many works from, I'm architect, but they, there are many works from uh, physics and mathematics uh, that are studying cities and studying the statistical uh, results of this kind of analysis and uh, getting some uh, findings <laughs> Uh, about the urban structure, uh, just on how to, how the, just about the distribution of the results. So, the next steps of this research would be uh, using not just the street, analysis like uh, the ones I, um, I showed before, but to include some in the representation of the urban graph, uh, the buildings and the activities uh, to have a more complete de description of cities. Uh, so we could really uh, related to some of the properties of Alexander, because he he, he talks about centers and subcent. A center is formed by another centers. It's a scale thing. So uh, let me show some image here. Uh, another works who that. Uh, already uh, uh, try to describe the urban spatial structure in a more complete way. And uh, there's some, some try of using uh, a graph which describes the, the streets and also the, the buildings. Uh, so it would be a matter of uh, having these centers and sub-centers units, like uh, Alexander says. So, uh, this work is, is not conclusive, it's, it's just, um, there are some, well, it provides some clues for further studies uh, on this very challenging task of operationalizing Alexander's ideas and uh, spatial network studies and GIS and uh, statistical packages uh, seem to be uh, a way of doing it. Um, the, the approach adopted enhances the idea that we can address the notion of wholeness and centers from a complex network perspective, uh, as previous suggested, but uh, we need to observe with there's a more careful selection of descriptive systems and measuring methods should be done, considering the uh, var variety of methods available. So we could test many of them. Uh, and try to do this, this relationship with the Alexander uh, geometric properties. That's it. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Alice. We'll have time uh, at the end of the four presentations for uh, discussion. Please, if you have any questions, keep it. Now, uh, I will call Rodi Stalfs from Singapore National University, Singapore, which will present potentiality analysis for urban design. Thank you. Um, this uh, is a research project 
that um, it's actually quite a practical research project that, uh, well, I'm doing with this with my colleagues, Patrick Jensen and uh, Ye Zhang, and uh, we're doing this with some uh, urban planners in um, Singapore. Now, to give a little bit of a background information, because urban planning is, of course, uh, can be quite different in different uh, areas of the world. In um, Singapore, the, um, there's a government agency called the Urban uh, Development Authority, which is the uh, main uh, government agency um, responsible for um, urban planning. And um, every, well, about every 10 years, they develop a concept plan, which is a plan that looks ahead uh, 40 to 50 years and tries to address issues of um, having enough space available for uh, further developments, uh, residential and others that may be um, required. And this is um, actually this is a, uh, an image from a, the land use plan for 2030 that was derived from this um, concept plan and which kind of shows in a very abstract way, you know, it's mostly focused on land use. So you can see the, the kind of like, um, well, um, I don't know, salmon-like uh, colors, that's all residential. The purple is um, industrial. Um, yellow is reserve. A lot of it is uh, land reclamation. Uh, green is parks, of course, and blue is, um, dark blue is commercial. It's the mo most important. What they also, oh well, from this exercise, they then every five years develop a master plan. And the master plan is really the regulatory um, yeah, framework that specifies, as you can see in a lot more detail, land use and um, density as expressed in uh, plot ratios um, for the entire um, country slash uh, city. Now the work that, uh, I mean, we've been focusing on this um, in like purple or Bordeaux area all the way in the um, southwest um, corner, which is called um, the Jurong Industrial Estate. And as you um, could have seen, um, it's mostly monofunctional um, industrial. Um, it's um, under the um, responsibility of the um, JTC uh, Corporation. Um, which is another uh, government agency, which is the largest uh, developer of um, industrial uh, land in um, Singapore. And uh, this is their largest um, area under their um, responsibility. Um, but as you can imagine, in um, a country like Singapore, which is uh, rather small and therefore very limited in um, its ability to um, further expand um, its um, activities, its, um, its uh, population, et cetera, that having such a large, I mean, this is about, um, for, for your information, about 4,000 um, hectares, um, having such a large um, area um, solely focused on industry is, um, not very realistic in terms of the future. So what um, JTC's uh, urban planning department has been doing is um, working on a vision um, for um, the area for the year 2050, in which um, they consider that um, there could be, I mean, this is all, of course, uh, uh, trying to just, uh, consider what might be possibilities for the future, uh, might have one million people living in this area um, in not replacing the industry, but in um, adjacency in, uh, with the industry, where the industry, of course, has progressed into a lot more um, clean tech uh, industry rather than um, some of the um, manufacturing and um, petrochemical industry that um, there is uh, now. So this is a very abstract, um, uh, yeah, 
scenario of their um, planning, which um, shows um, some ideas in terms of urban nodes that could then be um, further developed. And, um, and um, some greenery, et cetera. And so really the, 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 the issue that they're having is trying to develop these scenarios or such a scenario at a, a lot more level of detail requires a lot of time. And so um, it's not a problem, of course, they're urban planners, they can, they can, um, they can do this, but um, the, pro the issue is not to create just one um, scenario, but of course have a variety of scenarios so that we can uh, do some kind of um, uh, comparative analysis and um, choose uh, potentially which one could be the, the best. And this is where we've uh, come in, trying to um, help them to um, computationalize this process and to generate um, such um, scenarios. And the methodology that we're um, using is uh, basically a location choice uh, approach. So based on um, data that they have available and that we could um, um, make use of, we're doing a number of different um, analysis, looking at um, land availability, um, transit access, uh, green spaces, industry, um, road noise, etc., cetera, and um, taking all these individual analyses and then um, integrating them, aggregating them into some form of urban uh, potential. This urban potential is not, of course, per se, um, an identification of urban nodes and their um, growth areas. Um, we're not trying to replace <laughs> um, the planners, we're just trying to um, help them. So it's up to them to make the, um, the final um, choices. It just shows that if you, you know, take into account certain assumptions, then um, you can um, get a very um, detailed um, assessment of urban potential for the area. And um, so this is uh, quickly, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to it a bit later, um, how we try to combine um, aggregate these different analysis. You can see some weights, 40%, 30%. Now, of course, these are um, not, there's no theoretical um, foundation for these numbers. They're really meant as parameters that the urban planners um, could be playing with in order to, um, yeah, understand the, um, what really plays a role. So I'll um, go through each of the analysis um, relatively quickly. Um, this is, uh, so land availability, um, basically all the land is owned by um, JTC and leased uh, to the industries. So all the uh, land have um, lease ends that we could take into account. Um, there are other aspects of availability, um, nuisance buffers, um, but it's not so important. Uh, if, if you're more, if you're interested in it, you can uh, read about it in the paper. Safety buffers are very much linked to the um, type of industry and so to the um, lease ends. And um, then there's land reclamation, which is kind of the opposite, but in a way, it's exactly the same. So you could assign a date uh, when the land becomes available. Now, as we are not really working on a particular point in time, I mean, we're not trying to, of course, just look at uh, 2050. Uh, we need to assess um, over time what, where um, there's a potential for development. We're basically trying to reduce the um, time into some um, uh, normalization between zero and one. And the idea being that so if, if 2050 is kind of like their you know, main visionary point, maybe that should be the, the turning point. We uh, assign um, everything that's available right now gets a, a value of one. Everything that's available in 2050 gets a value of 0 0.5. And then there is, of course, the, um, the other side, let's say 2080, 2090, where it would be um, about zero. And so we have this um, curve that um, we can use to convert all these dates into um, values, normalized values. 
We tried to do the same thing for um, accessibility to transit. Here we do this based on some um, surveys that have been done previously um, in Singapore on um, walkability or um, how far people are interested in walking to um, MRT, so that's the, um, the, the, the subway, um, buses, and um, LRT, which is light rail um, transit. Um, and we basically did, did some, um, so, so, so most of the curves on here are actually um, given, are, well, they are, um, sorry, they are um, curves, curves fitted to the data that uh, we got out of these, um, well, surveys that were done by other people. So uh, w we just took their um, points and then tried to fit a curve through it and then uh, simplified it slightly. And the reason that our curve, the um, orange one, is slightly below is that um, all of these um, accessibility analysis surveys of course um, relate to real distances. Whereas we have this uh, very um, area, well this area where of course you could measure real distances but by the time 2050 comes around they may have changed um, roads, they may have um, changed uh, um, plots, etc. So it's kind of hard to um, really measure in distances and so we're, or um, real distances, so we measure it in um, straight line um, distances. And so we take a 80% um, um, value and that's why our curve is um, slightly lower. But so we basically, um, we um, taking a um, inflection point at 150 meters saying that, um, well, if it's closer than 150 meters, there's a high probability above half that people would walk there and if it's um, above 150 meters, then it would be um, lower. For MRTs, um, this value is a lot higher. It's not shown here, but it's um, from the study that we looked at, um, it's actually three times as much. So it's uh, 450 meters that we um, took. Uh, in terms of green spaces, it's of course, it, at this moment, there are very few um, green spaces in the area, um, but, um, in the design process, of course, new um, green spaces will be um, decided upon and this, then this can also be taken into account. There, uh, most studies don't only look at accessibility for which we um, are taking the exact same uh, curve as for um, transit, uh, for buses, um, but also take into account um, area. So how much um, green space, how many um, square uh, meters of green space is there available within um, a neighborhood? And um, for us, a neighborhood is, um, so it's a, um, since it's a straight line distance, we take it as a 640 meter um, radius. And um, we're not considering that if this whole area is full, that then it would be um, one because there are no such, I mean, there are very few uh, if any parks in Singapore that uh, are that um, large. So um, basically the idea is that about um, the largest parks are usually around half a square kilometer and so uh, a quarter of a square kilometer is the inflection point for the um, normalization. Presence of industry, um, we've uh, decided that um, in fact it's kind of assumed as part of the land availability especially that at the end we do a cumulative um, uh, uh, analysis over um, the entire um, area and um, as such it takes into account uh, neighboring um, availability and what is not available is of course we'll have industry. Exposure to traffic noise, this is also based on a, a study others have done of um, <coughs> both measurements and predictions and uh, so we um, it's about 70 um, decibels um, near the um, highway and um, we did some estimations that uh, showed that uh, um, if you want to reduce it to 50 decibels you would need require a distance of 340 meters and that's where this um, curve 
um, comes from. And uh, obviously, it's a curve that has a very long um, way before it reaches the, max the maximum because, um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> noise travels um, quite far. And the question is, you know, what kind of level um, do you really consider um, the best? So this is our, sure, this is our aggregate uh, analysis. So for uh, land availability, we look at um, lease ends and um, safety buffers. And since both are restrictive of um, what is available, the minimum is taken, and that's then um, the number for um, availability. Um, for um, transit, we look both at uh, MRT trunk buses and feeder buses, and um, despite already the difference between um, uh, walkability distance, we also acknowledge that um, people have a preference to um, use MRT over uh, trunk buses, over feeder buses, and th that's um, established in that uh, 0.75 and 0.50 uh, weight. And then this all, um, the uh, maximum is taken and um, that gives the transit value. For green spaces, it's just the sum of uh, proximity and aerial and, and noise, noise exposure. And as I said, the percentages are um, really for the um, planners to play with, but given on those particular um, percentages, this is actually the aggregate analysis that we um, achieved for the entire area. You can recognize the, um, the blobs around the MRT stations and the much smaller ones around the um, bus stops. What you can also recognize is this very large blue area, or at least a, uh, a blue foundation, is all relating to um, safety buffers that have to be taken into account. Um, and so the, um, the higher values are much more towards the north and towards the east, which is closer to existing um, residential. And then there's this small uh, pocket at the bottom. Um, so we did a, um, a cumulative analysis because in a way the um, aggregate analysis, well, shows for each point very clearly what this kind of value is. But of course, a node is not a single point. Um, it, it, it needs to develop um, some kind of, um, th there needs to be some kind of growth area around it for a neighborhood. Now this is based on a 640 meters um, radius and then you can, um, it gives a, yeah, a bit uh, more of a, an overall view of um, where there's a high, high potential. Nevertheless, um, you know, this is not, of course, final or, um, you know, there's still some comments that could be made about, you know, what happens with these places all at the bottom. Is it really that useful to have um, some um, uh, urban development there? So in, um, in conclusion, as a, a final discussion, the, um, we, uh, we acknowledge that the final selection of um, urban node and growth area is left to the planner. This is not something that we want to interfere in. We just want to give them the um, analysis that they can then um, play with, uh, uh, gain an understanding, and um, make decisions based on it. As a result, the weights have to be considered as parameters um, because otherwise with fixed weights, then you can't really understand why um, you know, a value is the way it is. Um, because it, it would, you would have to de-aggregate um, it back to its original values and by playing with the weights in a kind of like a slider thing um, similar to um, let's say some kind of parametric modeling um, it would be uh, fairly straightforward um, to get a, a bit of an understanding of um, really how important each of these different um, aspects are. We also consider that um, there might be some additional analysis that should be added. We've um, considered uh, diversity land use mix and entropy index, uh, which we haven't done yet. We also consider regional accessibility, which would, um, sorry, <laughs> which would avoid 
the, um, the, the, the high potential at a, at a, at far away from the rest of the country. And um, we all, I also want to um, emphasize that um, the selection of analysis is really based on data availability and on um, current work practices. And that's basically it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rudy. Uh, now we'll call Antonio Ascensão from Trasos Montes University, Portugal, which will present 3D space syntax analysis, attributes to be applied in landscape architecture projects. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to start by thanking the organization for the opportunity to present this work. It's an honor to present a work mm -hmm. related to our contribution as landscape architects to the development of the Dev Space 3D program. I'll be showing you the work I developed during my master thesis and that is still being developed. So public space plays a major role in the quality of life of citizens by making direct or indirect contact uh, in human interaction possible. It's important for us to understand how the spatial design will affect uh, the relations between people and the spaces they use. Many of the tools for uh, landscape architecture focus mainly on uh, presentation and rendering. <coughs> well, although these are valuable instruments uh, for the professional practice, uh, uh, and although some tools such as GIS and space syntax already fill the gap of a more informative design. Uh, many do, do not provide methods specifically targeting the creative uh, design process. For example, on the objective analysis of uh, visibility in a 3D environment. So the, the image I'm showing you now is uh, the case study uh, applied for this, uh, this work, the urban park in Maya Port. It was selected for being a space of relevance to the work we were developing. It has pre-existent buildings uh, related to sports in uh, that, that were existing, and also the municipal stadium and the training field that existed there. Also, with the proposal, it, ha it shows uh, mm -hmm. relevant altimetric, altimetric differences that uh, are of relevance to the, to the visibility analysis, and also it has a large number of plant species from which our work developed. So, in order to be able to understand what is and what isn't seen in the proposed public spaces. Most of the times we resort to 3D models and uh, renderings uh, to help us and also the client understand what the space will become in the future. And while it is our intention to show the reality, these images often are, uh, are um, these images often show the best that the space has to offer, uh, giving room to subjectiveness. What you are seeing now is the, the, the place as it is now, the existing situation. And I'm showing you what we are able to achieve with the, with the rendering. You see the, it, there uh, we created new spaces, pathways, and, uh, the, and uh, create a, uh, an interesting, a different space for the people to, to use. You know, uh, what you are seeing now is a cross section with a close up of the recreation areas uh, close to the lake. Um, uh, and you can see the, the effect that the topography might have on the visibility of, the, of these spaces. And to really show what would be seen in, uh, uh, in most, in all the situations, it, we would need to have a very big, a large number of images to be able to show what we want. So GIS uh, and space syntax actually can achieve this with the creation of view sets and uh, visual graphs in uh, two dimensions. <coughs> 3D models can also be created for, uh, for uh, which allow for an understanding of the spatial design. And through these models, we can create several, several uh, views of the, the space uh, to be able to understand what, uh, what will be done. And they're also a good way to show the project from a person's point of view. Even though these are great ways to show the, the design, it's, a difficult, it's difficult to have a complete idea what, of what will be seen uh, in the totality of the design space. 
So that's why uh, an objective 3D visual analysis is necessary. So from here we started to develop our, uh, our work to aid mm -hmm. in the development of the Dead Space 3D program. The main objective was to define attributes uh, that could be applied to the program and would allow for landscape architects and urban designers uh, and other professionals, of course, to analyze the, the public spaces. After this, defining these attributes and inserting, inserting them in the program, it would then be necessary to test them on a case study. So to begin with, we felt we needed to answer a few questions. What can and can't be seen in the spaces? What can, what can be seen throughout the year? And what can be seen throughout time? So what can and can't be seen? To simplify, in public spaces we have uh, the, the main volumes that are present in a landscape are the terrain itself with its topography. It can create uh, spaces, create viewpoints for the vast panoramas and also create obstacles to visibility. The buildings and of course the natural elements. Then we had to define uh, what these natural elements were. What are they and what marks their presence, their presence in the landscape? For the development of our work, we consider the trees and the large shrubs as we feel they are the, the ones that have, uh, that have a bigger impact on visibility. And so we had to look at them as uh, living beings. They, uh, they, we had to look at them from a spatial and temporal standpoint. So trees in their natural have, an environment have specific form and dimensions designated mainly by their genetic code and of course the, the situation they're in. They change throughout the year. The seedless plants lose their foliage around winter and evergreens keep their, keep their foliage uh, throughout the year. And throughout time, uh, they grow at different rates. So looking at the, at the various plant species we have, we can see immediate differences in their forms and dimensions. For example, the columnar form of the Italian cypress, the wide form of the umbrella pine, and the pyramidal form of the, of a cedar. So we gather this information for, um, for all of the species proposed in the case study. Uh, the, tab the table I'm showing you uh, represents the form and dimensions, the dimensions being considered in height and width, the ultimate, their ultimate height and width, considered for, their, uh, for optimal condi conditions. And we simplified form to five different shapes to insert in the Dead Sea 3D software. These are the, the, the volumes we consider. They had to be very simple in the beginning because of the calculation, uh, the calculation process. And so from left to right, we have a pyramidal form, conical form, rounded form, columnar form, and a wide form. We also had to consider them, out the, out, 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 we also had to consider, sorry, how they develop through time. Plants have different growth rates. They grow at, uh, we consider their growth rates as slow, medium, and fast. And we also, in considering these growth rates, we consider their plant dimensions after 20 years, taking into account their ultimate height presented in the previous table. So these are the shapes for each one of the species in, uh, in the case study, from the smaller to the bigger ones, the plants at the date of plantation, uh, the, plant, the expected growth at 20 years, and their, their, ultimate, their ultimate growth. <coughs> so finally, we had to also consider them, uh, the evolution of plants uh, throughout the whole year. Plants can be deciduous or evergreen, meaning they may or may not lose their foliage in winter time, which means that the visual permeability of the crown in winter and summer will be diff different. The table I, you're seeing now demonstrates the values of opacity for each one of the species of the case study. These are all average values calculated based on six photographs of the, uh, for each one of the, the species. And uh, in the case of the deciduous plants, we had to consider 12 photographs, to six for the winter and six for the, the summertime, when they, have in, when they don't have foliage. 
to quickly explain this process, first we took uh, pictures of the specimens scattered around different areas of the city, like parks, gardens, streets, etc., which had to have a very clear view of the background uh, and try to represent the natural form of the species to get the results closest to reality. Secondly, using an image editing program, we delimitate a simple shape following the exterior branches of the tree uh, and try to represent, uh, sorry, the, uh, and separate the selection from the rest of the image. Then with this selection, we obtain the total area and inside this selection, we separate the tree from the background to obtain the, the background area. And with these values, we, can, uh, we are able to obtain a percentage value that determines the, the opacity of the tree for winter and summer. So having all this defined, uh, mm -hmm. a model was then created inside the Dev Space 3D software, the bigger one that you're seeing in the, in the slideshow. Uh, I also put a, a smaller version of uh, the model we created in uh, SketchUp for your better understanding. You can see that the, the bigger volumes are represented by the buildings, the municipal stadium, and the training field are represented, and the smaller ones represent the, the trees and large shrubs. Also, the terrain in a darker color uh, is also shown there with the topography, although it's not easily understandable. So from this point, it was then possible to, uh, to analyze the, the space and answer the previous questions that I showed you. This slide shows how 3D renderings were used for both the study and the presentation of the visual qualities of design and were complemented with an isovist of the area. Um, in dark blue, uh, in, the isovist, in the representation of the isovist, you can see in dark blue, the, the color, this color represents the complete lack of visibility the red com uh, complete visibility and the uh, lighter colors in between uh, are the decrease in visibility due to the permeability of the, the vegetation. And you can see uh, in the 3D rendering, you can uh, uh, see that what is seen is actually what is shown in the, um, in the, in the isovist below. So, uh, it was also possible to analyze the effects of time in the, in the park's uh, visual connectivity by taking into account the vegetation growth and the uh, deciduous plants. This is important information to understand how the aging of the, the park will affect what people see and when they see it, and how people will make use of the space throughout it, its existence. However, while you can clearly see differences in the um, uh, as, as vegetation grows, uh, the density of the park causes visibility to, the, vi the visibility values to be similar for winter and summer months. You can see the summer months represented in the top, uh, in the top three images and the winter months represented in the bottom, the bottom three. So this, uh, the, these adding opacities do not seem to, to fit perfectly with, uh, with reality. This, is, this part is still a, a work in progress and uh, we expect that future work will bring better, better results. Uh, this analysis also contributed for a better understanding of uh, the spatial behavior of the design, allowing for the confrontation of design objectives with the actual results. This was useful in the construction of a desired relations, uh, relationship between the interior and the exterior of the park where the interior should be felt removed from its uh, urban surroundings. And subtle alterations could be made until the design expectations were validated through visibility analysis resulting in the final design, showing uh, low levels of visibility from both the exterior pathways and the interior of the park and vice versa. It's also, see to, it's also possible to see that the place where the, the, the main entrance was uh, <coughs> was placed behave as a logical entry because this is the place that allows for the highest levels of uh, visual permeability between the, the park and its immediate surroundings. It was also uh, uh, possible to apply visibility analysis to a smaller scale to study the characteristics of the particular spaces. Analysis were made from th three main viewpoints of the park which are represented in the top three images. 
these uh, these viewpoints were designed as the uh, the, t the highest points present in the space, which would allow for uh, uh, great uh, for the best vis visibility over uh, great areas of the space. Uh, with these images, we were able to identify a few problems. Uh, for example, in the second image from the top, uh, the eyes of East from uh, Gazebo, it, uh, it shows high levels of visibility to the exterior of the park. Also, in, uh, in, uh, in the third image on the top, it was possible to see that uh, the eyes of East that is located in the second floor of, the, of a proposed building, the cafe bar, uh, which should have uh, full visibility to the training field as a, a lighter a lighter area, mm -hmm. uh, which was not uh, uh, in project was not uh, um, considered because there's a, a plant uh, a tree planted there that cuts the visibility. <coughs> On the other hand, it's also it also shows that the eyes of it from the walkway, the first one from the top. Uh, creates great visibility over the lake area, which, which was the original intention. Additionally, it was possible to identify in, fig in the figures at the bottom that the intention of creating uh, visual variation uh, with movement so that the park cannot be grasped from a single point, but only through explorative meandering, was successful. Uh, as these spaces appear defined with clear variations in visual connectivity levels, appealing to movement throughout the park. Uh, other analysis were also able to, to be made. This is a complementary approach to the 3D analysis of the global volume, where we can understand the visual connectivity at different heights in, with, uh, with two-dimensional slices of the park. These are represented from heights of between three and three meters. So this is what we have done up, alti, up, up until now. Uh, in conclusion, the experimental application of attributes and parameters in the Depth Space 3D software allowed us to understand the, the interest that this program might have <coughs> uh, had during the development of the, the project. And while it is still a work in progress, the results in the experimental application of the attributes and parameters relating to ground modeling and vegetation seem to be of, uh, of great interest. While the selection and the application of attributes for terrain, form, and dim dimensions and growth uh, were considered successful, we still have some work to do in, in what concerns the permeability of the, of the vegetation as we felt these results did not represent the, the reality. The analysis was a continuous process that took place through various stages of the, the design process and consequently the program also uh, evolved uh, uh, to, to accommodate specific necessities that had not been foreseen before. The connection between analysis and design proved useful in obtaining an efficient design and improvement of the software for use in uh, landscape architecture. So we expect that uh, future versions with the work we are uh, still developing will further improve in this area, expanding its use. Thank you. Thank you very much, Antonio. Now I will call uh, the last speaker of this session. Philippe Brandão from ISCTE, Lisbon University Institute, Portugal, uh, which will present Measuring Urban Renewal, a dual kernel density estimation to access the intensity of building renovation. So, good afternoon. Uh, this uh, work is, was developed in, during the, the beginning of my PhD in ISCTE UL uh, in 2016, at the end of 2016. Um, it start, the part, uh, my work actually is not about uh, urban, re uh, urban renovation itself, but about the construction for uh, urban renovation. But uh, as, as I was starting to develop this work, a uh, question came up as we, I was visiting buildings around the city and uh, building renovation was starting to become a very important issue and, uh, around the, Lisbon and Porto. And, uh, buildings, uh, a lot of buildings that had been um, uh, completely damaged throughout the years and neglected started um, 
uh, you, we started seeing this around the city, lots of interventions, uh, cranes popping up everywhere, and the question came up as how we could easily understand this phenomenon with, uh, with limited information, and how we could um, analyze this or uh, look into it with more detail. Uh, so uh, looking at uh, traditional approaches with statistic statistical tools for uh, building renovation, we know that it gained a, a very big relevance in the, in the context of Portugal for several reasons, namely because uh, the market prices of uh, uh, of the buildings uh, collapsed and also the construction market uh, started to have much less work than previously and building renovation started to have a more uh, relevance in the context of construction work. But uh, when we look at this type of information, we don't really understand what's happening at the level of the city because it doesn't provide us a lot of information of the, the place where it's happening and at, at what rate this is happening. So our our first approach, so we, we know that we have a large amount of dispersed small interventions in urban renovation and this, uh, these uh, interventions are promoted by a diverse group of uh, private and public stakeholders, but mostly private uh, stakeholders. And they are focused around uh, historical and city centers in at the, uh, that uh, ex uh, city expansions from the end of the 19th century and uh, they are acting upon a, a urban morphology which is dense and uh, with, uh, constituted mainly of small plots and also it's an ongoing process. We, don't, we, we know it's, uh, it's, it started some time ago but then it's continuing uh, uh, all the time. So the problem was that uh, since it's an ongoing process and it's, which is happening within the cities and with a dispersed pattern, uh, traditional statistical tools, like the one I previously showed, uh, have uh, problems representing what is happening. Uh, so these uh, two graphs there are uh, actually from the databases of uh, uh, building permits of the city of Lisbon and the city of Toronto. And they re represent the uh, renovation, the building renovation, and they compare it with uh, uh, construction which is happening within, within the city. From, so we started out our first approach with uh, obtaining information from the databases of the city of Lisbon, which we requested, and also open data from the city of Toronto. So the, the first approach was trying to um, understand, so getting this information uh, of database with often numeric information, and also the vector-based information <coughs> with shape, gram, shape, uh, shape uh, files. So we... Uh, so I, I'm, a, I'm an architect, I'm not an urban planner, so m my f natural approach would be to use this using a, a visual programming environment or a CAD environment. So we uh, tried to develop two approaches to understand how we could, uh, me as an architect and uh, also as a, a colleague as an urban planner, could use this uh, information to try to understand the phenomenon. Um, so uh, this uh, database contained uh, information ab about the, um, the entry and the uh, approval of uh, building renovation process and, and uh, building permits in general. And we can, from this database, we can understand that, uh, so visualizing this information year by year, we can understand that there has been a very inc uh, big increase in, in terms of uh, interventions within the center of the city concentrated on the uh, central part of Lisbon. Uh, so the first approach, we, th we tried to visualize this, the, the duration of the uh, building permits in uh, using the, the polygons of the buildings and extruding this uh, time-based information to create a visualization of this uh, process. Uh, this is focused on the center of Lisbon uh, and we, we can see there that there's uh, the uh, red, uh, yeah, uh, red and orange colors are mainly from renovation types and there's a blue one which is from building construction. So, uh, this allows us to understand more or less where it's happening, but we, we cannot understand, so first this is Toronto, which is the same approach, but using 
in this uh, two-dimensional uh, visualization where we can see the, the green are the, the processes that are very fast and the red ones are the ones that last very long. Uh, also with, with G's uh, using a, a, vid uh, a video approach where we try to visualize this process happening at, at along the time. So this is a, a, a frame of the video itself and at the city scale. But as we get to this scale, we start to see uh, problems understanding uh, the process and trying to uh, uh, make sense of it uh, at this scale because uh, uh, occlusion problems happen when we try to look at it and from a 3D perspective and uh, also in the plan of the city is not easy to understand what's happening or uh, to try to, to make sense of it. So uh, the advantages of using this type of uh, methodology was, would be to portray, portray the time and space dynamics of urban renewal on the territory where it happens, where they occur and overcoming the lack of spatial information and local detail in traditional statistical representations. Uh, but uh, it, it could be used for architects for trying to, to understand when the renovation is happening. It could be useful in terms of uh, finding out which, which areas are more, uh, where there's more concentration of renovation, where there, where there could be areas for uh, uh, further expansion. Um, but there are, there's many limitations. Uh, it's not readable at city scale. Uh, there are occlusion problems when you try to visualize this type of uh, representations and they represent the occurrence of renovation but not, do not compare it with the uh, underlying density of the urban morphology. Uh, but also, building permit databases do not account for uh, all the renovation work. We know that uh, because some renovation is exempt and also that there's not all renovation is uh, uh, proceeded legally. So. Uh, from this uh, um, analysis of this first approach, we tried to develop a, me a method of measuring this urban renewal intensity, implementing a dual kernel uh, density estimation using a commonly available uh, computational tools that, are, that exist in city halls like uh, G's and also the ones architects are familiar with, which are uh, CAD uh, programs. So the, the first image is the um, uh, database itself of the city of Lisbon. And uh, what we try to do is create a, a script that uh, gets this information, processes and generates a, a kernel density estimation map. So the, the Lisbon city building permit database has lots of information. The one that they can provide and it's already public is are the fields which is a G's ID, which is the, the most important field that allows the connection of the database with the shape files uh, yeah. of the city. And the dates which could have dates of entry of the uh, request, decision, approval, uh, and permit issue for construction. And the type of permit, which is uh, important information that allows us to understand which, is, which uh, building permits are for renovation or for construction, demolition, or other types of activities and uh, the type of uh, administ administrative procedure, which um, the terms are in Portuguese, but uh, they relate to the type of uh, uh, procedure that makes sense. So for is we would be concentrating on li licenciamento e comunicação prévia, which are the, bil the activities that, uh, that uh, will be, uh, that will generate construction actually. And uh, uh, one of the fields also is uh, reject or accept, so a decision can, can be, a permit can be requested but not approved by the city hall, which of course doesn't mean that the building is going to be constructed or there's going to be activity at the, in the city. Uh, so the database contains all permits requests that were made to the city hall, uh, which may or may not materialize into actual construction work. To have a more accurate estimate of uh, actual renovation work, only the entries that meet the following criteria uh, were selected. So this is the uh, selection procedure. So we, we only select uh, uh, entries that uh, are uh, comunicação prévia or licenciamento, which uh, have uh, related types of uh, permit types that are related with building renovation, which have not been rejected by the city hall and which have a date of entry and a date of uh, permit issue. So they will be actually uh, 
not uh, accurately, uh, not totally sure, but they will probably be constructed. Uh, there are also, of course, important limitations which relate to the type of to the information that we have on the database and, um, uh, and what is uh, there. So this is, uh, is exactly what I said before, but the, the database doesn't contain all the renovation that happens in the city. Some renovation is not reported and uh, some re uh, renovation doesn't not necessarily need to do so. So it's all, all an incomplete image of or any complete sample of the actual renovation work that's happening. So for, for that reason, the, the KDA is, makes sense. So this is the workflow for uh, a grasshopper environment. So we import the building permit data and filter the relevant fields to try to uh, uh, organize the information. And uh, there are uh, 13,864 building permits in, in the period of 2010, 2016. Uh, 7,662 7, are uh, unique GIS IDs. This happens, is, it's a, another problem of the database, which is uh, many buildings, uh, they don't have a, a horizontal property implemented in a database. So uh, when two uh, building permits enter for the same building, the building can have uh, two pro horizontal properties with the same, within the same polygon. So they put two entries for this uh, same GIS ID. So there are a lot of uh, repetitions of, uh, with the same time entry, the, the same pr uh, procedure, and the same date of exit to, to, the, to the database. So we need to remove all these duplicates. Uh, there are other types of duplicates, but they are m m much less number. Um, uh, so, the, um, okay, so the, then we remove the duplicates and uh, try to filter the, the, the entries that uh, interest us. And then, of course, on the bottom, the same methodology, but in this case, implemented in GIS. So we only keep the building relevant types and remove the permit, uh, rejected permit applications. So uh, kernel density estimation. So for the method we are using to try to, to produce uh, intensity estimation. Uh, it's a method of a special uh, a smooth probability density function, function based on discontinuous uh, specially distributed underlying data. So um, it overcomes incomplete data, so this, this is the problem we have. We don't have all the renovation that happens. And it provides estimations on the continuous density of uh, the observed phenomena, so the rebuilding renovation. And it's adequate for the investigation of uh, informal investigation of properties of data sets, uh, providing information about skewness and multimodality, and uh, has the capacity to provide readability at the city scale, which was a problem of a previous att attempt. Uh, so this is more or less how it works. It's a, it's a mathematical function which was developed in the 60s, or the 50s and end of 50s and beginning of 60s. So it requires a number of the points of where the renovation actually happens. Uh, and uh, there's their parameter, which is the width. Uh, the width is um, the width of the function, the kernel function, which is in the bottom. It, and there's a summation of these functions uh, uh, based on the distance to the, to the points. Uh, there are several types of uh, kernel that can be implemented. The graph there is a multi uh, univariate example of the kernel density estimation. And uh, the functions that are represented there are the Gaussian function, but we will be using a different one. This, this is the, the two-dimensional approach. Uh, the, the, the principle is the same. Uh, it produces a, a three-dimensional surface um, and uses the, the points where the renovation are ha is happening. And a kernel function, which in our case is a epa Neshnikov function. The difference between the previous one is this is the parabolic function that cuts the, the, the information af, uh, after a given distance, with, which is in this case the window. We are using a 400 meter window, which uh, comes from previous studies of uh, walkability, so it's, it gives us a measure of uh, a neighborhood. Uh, an analysis mesh, which is the, the actual surface, uh, the, uh, the dimension of the, of the edge of the surface, give, uh, you can see on the images, uh, determines how, how the quality of the generated surface, but doesn't influence very much the result we have. Uh, the, uh, the window, on the other hand, is very important uh, uh, um, uh, parameter because 
it ca it, it's the one that smooths the information and removes the un uh, unwanted detail that is uh, at the level of the CT. So, uh, but you can see on the, uh, the images also that one of the advantages of this method is that's not very much influenced by the distance to the border. So if you have uh, the example there has the same number of points uh, in the middle of the surface on the end of the surface, you can see that th there's not much difference in terms of uh, estimation. So this is a comparison with uh, uh, histogram methods. So a uh, problem with histograms is that if you, if you change the, the origin of the, of the, um, of the analysis uh, of the grid or you, you rotate the analysis, the analysis grid, the, the estimate changes. So uh, this is implementation of the, of the script in the Grasshopper and the equivalent plugin for, um, for kernel SD, uh, for um, uh, G's environment. And uh, this is some of the, uh, so how it uh, turns out. So you have the points in the city, you produce a, a graph, uh, a map with this information. Uh, at the bottom you have a script for generating the contours in uh, Grasshopper. So this is the uh, kernel S estimation overlaid over the CT uh, map. Uh, but the problem with the, so this is the G's approach, this is similar, divided by year. So you can see how it uh, evolves throughout the years of uh, renovation. Uh, but the problem with using this uh, renovation uh, as, as a estimation is that uh, the CT has a density. So you cannot assume that the fact that there's a higher density of, in the center of the city means that there's a higher intensity of the renovation. So to achieve that, what we do is divide the actual density of the city, uh, the, whole, the whole buildings of the city, the centroids of all buildings, by the renovation uh, kernel that we have. That gives us um, the, a, a different type of map, and this actually it relates much more with the, the reality. Uh, there are some surprising things that we were not foreseeing. We know that uh, the, uh, the area between Baixa and uh, Avenida Liberdade is the most intense area of renovation. We weren't expecting that uh, par uh, Parque das Nações was also an area with some intervention. So this is the same approach, but in G's, uh, also uh, all along the years. Uh, and um, is a comparison between the two approaches and the maps that generates for the whole period of 2010, 2016. So using a uh, dual kernel density, density is possible to uh, produce a measure of intensity of renovation that correlates events with existing fabric of the city and can be, be visualized on a map. Uh, it strikes a balance between uh, an analytical and synthetic representations uh, without the loss of underlying information of the city. Uh, the same methodology can be used uh, to analyze different types of events at the CC scale and it's easy to implement in parametric programming uh, environments which are more familiar to architects. So uh, f uh, the point, of course, of this work is try to uh, you reuse this, uh, architects can reuse this information to uh, uh, in open data environments where you can have access to databases of the cities like the city of Toronto I previously showed. You can access this information and uh, use it to produce in your in the environments which you are familiar with uh, produce visualizations that can tell us something about phenomena that happen in the city and that are, are harder to understand uh, with other tools. Uh, so limitations of uh, this method are related with the fact that distances are being measured in a two-dimensional space. So even though uh, a relatively small window was used, it's inevitable that some overflow will occur when you have uh, a neighbor, neighboring areas with high and low density uh, uh, the density of renovation processes. Uh, it's not appropriate for that reason for block uh, level definition. And the, another problem is that the sample should be random, and which is not exactly the case we are dealing with because we are, are having the, the uh, and even though it's not uh, complete, it's, it's an, uh, a skewed representation of the renovation that is, that is happening because likely larger renovation when it involves demolition of buildings and uh, it, it, it needs to be reported to City Hall. So it's quite likely that all the, the buildings that need to demolishing are being reported to, to the City Hall. Whereas the buildings that lead, need slight renovations are not, so it's a skewed representation. And uh, there are also improvements that could be done by trying to use the different 
types of uh, uh, points. So instead of using centroids to, to, to measure the kernel density estimation, we could use, for instance, the building address, which would correct some of the problems with the distances and the back streets. And, uh, well, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Philippe. Now I will call the four presenters and we'll have a uh, discussion period. Uh, you said that you were supporting a uh, local authority uh, regarding the, um, the planning strategy for that area. Um, and that uh, you were um, having this contribution regarding the data that you were working on and how they can uh, be a, um, a valid input to the, to the local authority regarding the, the, the plan that they have to, to that area. Uh, you, you didn't mention the private investment there. I, I are they uh, in a previous stage or uh, are they working with you and the local authority regarding the, um, the strategy that is being structured to, to that area? How the, how the, the private investment get into the, the play, if you want, get in the, in the, into the game, if you want, and how they react to your work? Because sometimes there's a gap between the, um, the data analysis and the, what you are considering the best option in terms of a planning strategy, and what is the, the private uh, um, uh, focus to a certain area, and how you, and, and, and if is that, if is that is being um, taken into uh, account or, or not, if, if that is a different moment uh, in within the process, that's my question. Uh, then I will ask that. Another one. Bit of a difficult uh, question in the context of Singapore because um, there's in fact very little private involvement in this. So the um, JGC uh, Corporation, which is acts as a um, private developer, let's say, is actually a government um, agency. I mean, it's a semi-public uh, uh, agency. And um, they own all the land and they really um, decide in a way, um, together with other government agencies, how this development will take place. Then they will only bring in private developers at the moment that they've already decided, for example, this plot will have this kind of development, and now we, um, you know, we're willing to bring in a private developer to actually construct um, the building. Um, that's only at the at the level. So we really only have one um, uh, group, let's say, to talk to. There's nobody else involved in this um, process. And um, it's, uh, I mean, it, it, it's, it's a bit, it's, uh, well, it's complicated in that sense that, uh, you know, sometimes it's useful to have different parties involved to kind of, you know, have some kind of a balance and checks and balances, etc. So here it is uh, very much up to the um, government agency to make sure that they consider all um, the different uh, aspects. And, um, and I, I, I guess this is you know, one of the things that they are um, uh, struggling with. Um. Between Philip and Rudy, I saw a big difference. A difference. CTO in Lisbon is trying to understand what is happening. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, yes. in Singapore, there is a large uh, planning effort. How this happened? <laughs> I could say in Porto, in the last 20 years, the four or five more important uh, defining things in uh, urban uh, development, first were, uh, was, uh, were uh, produced and then they went in the plan. For example, it's absolutely uh, Unbelievable, but the metro uh, under, uh, underground uh, network was constructed first and then it was introduced in the plan. <laughs> it's unbelievable, it's true. <laughs> uh, well, my question is uh, how 
Well, I, I saw uh, Rudy put 40% in, uh, in the land uh, uh, availability. Well, uh, <laughs> but uh, here in Portugal, there is very, very little capacity of uh, those who work in urban planning to demonstrate uh, the kindness of their solutions to develop cities that uh, are not going to be very, very ill some years from now. They are very ill just now. Uh, what is the capacity of those who work uh, scientifically with those uh, questions, uh, with those issues to to influence those who decide? It's uh, my question. Well, <coughs> there is another one for... Uh, Sorry, Alice. Uh, well, your um, presentation reminded me of something in uh, aesthetic discussion is about form and uh, not for what shapes, shapes defining beauty. That is a very old question that define uh, what we say academism. Academism says that there are some definitions very well that determine definitions of shapes that define beauty. Well, of course, Alexander does, doesn't call beauty, but harmony seeking. It's not the same thing, but uh, it's a aesthetical question. Well, I have nothing a, a, a against academism when they are created. I am against academism when they are used after they are created. <coughs> because academism uh, represent, uh, well, in the first stage, represent uh, arriving to some, uh, well, very important solutions to problems that exist uh, in some time. Uh, but that this question is, uh, well, they have centuries. Why are you trying to to walk in the same question that uh, I think it's solved uh, some time ago. <laughs> it's my, my, my question. <coughs> yeah, okay, I'll uh, quickly. Um, I, I mean, I think that there's a, uh, you know, a lot of uh, benefit to be had on you know, the kind of uh, methods that you're applying, uh, Philip, in, your, in, in the research. We've tried to do um, something um, similar in Singapore. Um, I mean, similar. Uh, we used some data mining techniques to try to understand a uh, relationship between um, different aspects of building, let's say orientation, height, uh, etc., in relationship to um, um, energy consumption. So uh, looking at existing data and trying to understand what kind of relationships that there are and what kind of conclusions um, that could be drawn. But um, yes, uh, Singapore is a very special um, case. Well, I mean, maybe you know, there's, there, there are similar cases in, in, in Asia um, where there's large uh, developments going on. Um, it is, most of the land is um, government owned and so they have a lot more um, control on uh, what, what um, can be done or what um, will be done in the future. And um, it is also, unfortunately, I should say, is that buildings don't really have a long uh, lifetime. I, um, you know, I, I can't really say, of course, what the average uh, lifespan is of a building here in, um, in uh, Portugal, but I'm sure it's a much longer than the 30 years that um, you know, an average building in Singapore lasts, even though it's built for a lot much longer. Uh, usually, after 30 years, they decide, well, you know, renovation is just going to be too costly. We'll just tear it down and build something new. <laughs> uh, well, I would say that uh, your dis description of the problem is perfectly accurate, and but some information is better than none. So, to have we have a, a situation where uh, planning does not relate exactly what with what is happening in, at the city's level. You have renovation happening everywhere. It's promoted by private investment. And some of it is destroying, uh, other is doing good renovation. We, we have, not like in, 
in, uh, in Singapore probably, but the, uh, renovation makes sense because uh, when, you know, when you keep a building, you, you, you renovate it, you are removing, uh, you are keeping uh, material that was invested, uh, 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 a building at, at many levels, not only at an economical level and a cultural level, but also at the uh, ecological level because you, you, you invest energy, uh, materials and uh, carbon at the end of the day but to build the building and if you're tearing it everything down you're just throwing everything away to rebuild new so it I think it makes sense economically uh, it makes sense culturally it makes sense I think at every level so to know what's happening and to understand uh, I think it makes sense because because we can also start to create strategies to to address the problem so it's important to, to develop uh, these information uh, gathering strategies. Now, Elise, or the most difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> Very difficult. Well, uh, my work uh, is in the context of science-based design and this kind of uh, discussion. Uh, and uh, as I said, it, it's very difficult to uh, include uh, analytical uh, methods in, in design. Uh, and uh, Alexander, uh, he, he says we could have a design based uh, in well, not a design, but he he, he, he talks about mor a morphogenesis process uh, in nature and in design it's uh, similar. We have a, a, a process of, of um, unfolding shapes uh, and his point is that we can have a contribution from an architecture perspective to complexity science. Uh, my work is more about curiosity in exploring this. Uh, and uh, uh, as I said, not questioning uh, why he is saying this, but if he is right, if I don't know if you, we actually have uh, universal rules of, of shapes, uh, but uh, he studied a, lo a lot this, so let's say if he has some point, he, if he is right, if the, the 15 or, or something similar to the 15 properties uh, are really the universal rules of the universe, like he says. Uh, how could we operationalize this and uh, transform it in, in a way of uh, analyzing our designs, urban design? And, and uh, I don't know if I answered <laughs> the question because it's very difficult, but uh, it's something like that. I, I just would like to 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 share my thought on Ali's work on the Alexander's theory. Um, I, I, you, you you said that uh, um, that uh, Alexander said that uh, the mathematicians for the wholeness is still not development. I don't think he, he, he said that. I don't remember he said that on, on his books. Um, Christoph Alexander was a it is a mathematician hims himself. Um, he said that the, the mathematics could be developed for other people. <laughs> he works with Nico Salingers, who developed all the mathematician. And, um, and I think he, he, it's just because he doesn't want to to follow that path, he just choose this uh, path of subjectivity, but he he, chair, he shares it. He's a he's a shared subject, subjectivity. I, d I think 
this is very important, uh, um, picking up the, the three concepts that we talk here, that we as just suggested here, about formalization, quality, and creativity. Um, Christoph Alexander was maybe the first persons to start the, the formal methods with the seed is not a tree, half a century ago in the 60s. So he, he comes from this mathematician, uh, uh, and, I, and I think he's, he's choosing this, this path of intuition, uh, of creativity, but is shared. And I think this is the problem uh, with these different kind of designers with the formalization methods or not. Uh, the problem is they don't want to share the method, whatever it is, this method. And I think Christoph Alexander is an example of uh, sharing his subjectivities. And uh, looking at these theories of, of Alexander, it, it's difficult to explain. It maybe looks a little silly if you don't understand all the concept and all the all the context and all the the the, the, the way that Christoph Alexander has done. It's just to share at this talk, <laughs> maybe if you want to comment. Do you want to comment? Well, there is a, uh, some related work to Nature of Order, which I uh, cited. Uh, I think it's Harmony Seeking Computations, uh, the other, I can't remember the name. But he, he talks about, um, uh, he proposed some research agenda uh, towards uh, a uh, more concrete uh, definition of the the properties. He admits they are loosely uh, defined, and to uh, actually use it, uh, uh, it would be necessary uh, some a better definition, a more preci precise definition. Uh, and for some reason he didn't want it or to, to do this and uh, he just su suggested it. So uh, my work it, it is uh, um, one possible way of doing this. I, I, I'm sure uh, it must be many, many ways because his theories are uh, very uh, subjective and wide, uh, and uh, they can embrace uh, many interpretations, I think. Uh, I think this is a good topic for discussion at lunch. Uh, <laughs> it's getting interesting, uh, the discussion, so I think uh, that we'll close this session here and we'll keep it uh, on lunch. Uh, according to the timetable, we should return at 2 o'clock. Thank you very much.